Good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Catherine Ambali Green Johnson. My pronouns are she and her. I'm the director of programs at the Laundromat Project, and welcome to Valuing Place and Practice Create Change Fellows Final Presentation. Um, I'm a Black woman uh, with, brown, with dark brown locks uh, in a strawberry blonde side bang, wearing gold hoops, uh, gold hoop earrings, red lipstick and a hot pink peplum top that has shoulder cutouts. Uh, to start off, we wanted to share that you do have access to closed captions at the bottom of your screen. You can toggle those um, on if you uh, like to use them. I also wanted to share that this session is being recorded and while uploaded, and will be uploaded, sorry, to um, our YouTube channel if you're interested in reference afterwards. I'd like to take a moment to offer a land acknowledgement as we begin all of our public programs. Uh, the Laundromat Project respectfully acknowledges that we are in Brooklyn, uh, the occupied and unceded lands of the Canarsi, who are part of the Monte Lanape. We recognize them as the original stewards of this land and pay respects to their elders past, present, and future. We acknowledge that they offer deep gratitude. Um, I'm sorry, we acknowledge and offer deep gratitude to this Lenape land that supports us as we are gathered together. I invite you to join me in that acknowledgement, that respect, and that gratitude. Um, I typically take my shoes off in this moment, uh, which I am doing now to get connected to land. I invite you to do the same. Thank you. If you are with us tonight and you are not familiar with the Laundromat Project, we are an arts organization that advances artists and neighbors as change agents in their own communities. We carry out this mission through our Create Change Artists in Residence and Fellowship programs, our community engagement initiatives, and our public programs. Our Create Change program is the LP's flagship annual artist development program that supports the learning of community artists who are invested in developing a critical community-based practice via workshops, um, coaching, guest speakers, and peer support, amongst others. This final presentation session is an opportunity for our wonderful cohort of fellows to share more about the group art activations that they worked so hard on over the course of the program. For this session, feel free to send any words of encouragement to these dynamic artists. We love having ongoing engagement and conversations in the chat with you all. I'll now pass it to our executive director, Kenny, to offer brief remarks and to introduce our host. Hello, good evening, everyone. I am Kemi Alesami, she, her pronouns. I'm the executive director of the Laundromat Project, an honor. And I am wearing a kind of goldish orange dress and red glasses um, in front of a bookshelf. Uh, and I'm wearing a very big smile because I'm very excited to be here tonight and in community with this incredible, uh, and very special to us um, group of artists. Uh, these, this group um, were the first artists that helped us really bless our new space in Bed-Stuy, um, our new home, which we invite you to visit uh, as well. And they helped us to be in community um, over the last uh, several weeks. Um, doing incredible activations and affirmations and offerings of joy and creativity across Bed-Stuy. Um, so they will forever hold a place in our hearts for that reason. Uh, we, I wish you all congratulations. Um, so incredible to have you join our group of 200 and counting alumni. Um, and I wanna just share a, a short, Octavia Butler um, kind of statement poem that actually comes from Emergent Strategy, which Adrian Marie Brown, um, which we highly recommend. So Octavia says, all successful life is adaptable, opportunistic, tenacious, interconnected and fecund. Understand this, use it, 
shape God. God might be your art, your creativity, your joy, your love, your abundance, your commitment to your people. Um, and I have already seen all of you uh, show that in the ways that you have shown up for each other, uh, for the communities that we work with and engage in a, and are part of, um, for uh, the LP and so many other folks. And it's been really beautiful and inspiring. Uh, and we're just so excited and thrilled that you are part of the LP family for now and for always. Um, and that you have embraced some of the things that we really consider as fundamental values and ways of being in the world. So one is that you practice abundance, that sense of being enough, having enough, and being able to give of your enoughness. Uh, to the world and again to each other. And you have so clearly shown what it looks like to be propelled by love, love that is joyous and passionate and filled with both protest and the possibilities of change. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm really, really excited along with everyone else to hear uh, more about your journey with us and your journey ahead um, in the time that we'll have with you this evening. But once LP fam, always LP fam. Um, so again, huge congratulations. And with that, I'm now gonna pass it to our incredible uh, host, Natasha Logan, who has been such a friend and um, community member for the LP for years. So we're really excited that you were able to join us tonight. And for those who don't know, I'll share a little bit of her bio. She is the Deputy Director at Creative Time. Uh, since joining the team in 2016, she has held numerous roles, including project manager to director of programming. Since then, she has contributed to several recent large-scale exhibitions, including Duke Riley's Fly by Night, Pedro Reyes' D uh, Democracy, uh, Sof Sophie Kyle's Here Lie the Secrets, Pledges of Allegiance, and uh, Phil Collins' Bring Down the Walls. Before joining Creative Time, Natasha worked alongside uh, respected artists from across film, fine arts and interactive technology, including uh, Hank Willis Thomas and his various collaborative projects, her management of uh, Question Bridge and in, in the Search of Truth, the Truth Booth. Um, and her film credits include being a co-executive uh, producer for an oversimplification of her beauty by Terrence Nance and the transmedia uh, producer for the documentary film, American Promise. Um, so that's just a little bit of what Natasha brings to the table. But again, really wonderful um, to have all of you here and I'll pass it over to Natasha. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks Kimmy. Um, it's really such a pleasure to be with y'all tonight and I'm really glad you could join us to celebrate um, this cohort of fellows in the 2022 Create Change Fellowship. Um, so tonight we'll be hearing them reflect on their projects and takeaways from the program. So as Kimmy shared, my name is Natasha Logan. I'm zooming in from Brooklyn. That's the unceded ancestral land of the Munsee Lenape people, as Catherine mentioned. Um, and I'm really excited to host this program with you and learn together with you about these artists and their presentations. Um, just to give a little bit of background on where I'm seated, um, I am sitting in a pretty nondescript basement uh, fake office in my home. I'm wearing uh, my black hair and a ponytail, low ponytail. I have one silver teardrop earrings and a triangle pattern print dress. Um, and I too am sharing, I think a pretty big smile um, as it's really an honor to be part of this and to um, participate in this session. And I'm looking forward to hearing more as well. So this cohort of artists um, have practices that encompass public works and projects that are participatory, education centered and collective in nature. Um, they illustrate these elements through community activations that they designed together and the projects incorporated critical modes of storytelling, community mapping and writing with an intergenerational population of Bed-Stuy community members. 
So the program is organized so we can receive the reflections on their community engagement act um, actions directly from the artists themselves. So here's the structure for today. We'll experience three group presentations. They're each about 12 minutes long. We won't do a formal Q&A, but I will ask a few questions after each presentation. And I encourage everyone who's in the audience with us today to activate the chat box. Your questions, reflections, reactions, and comments will be greatly appreciated. And the incredible staff at LP will be collating those responses in a mural board for the artists to take along um, on their journey. So to get us started, our first presentation is on a project titled Sidewalk Dreams. So this community activation presented an aggravated altar of the community dreams for of community dreams for Bedsty. The group fellows presenting are Jessica Cortez, Kyra Asibe Bansu, and Shari Jones. There's a fourth member of the group, Wallace Johnson, who's unable to join us today, but is a vital member of the team behind the work. So to introduce the project, I will have the artists. I'll, I'll share a brief our bio for each artist. Um, forgive me because I'm reading a little bit, which I don't love doing, but I haven't memorized quite all of this information. So um, Jessica is a Chicana theater artist who is passionate about centering people of color in all of her creative work and views theater as a tool for community, community building, education, and activism. Kyra is an urbanist who loves creating safe spaces with a socio-anthropological mindset in order to embolden the stories that we don't hear in the mainstream media. And Shari is the creator of Asnia, which is a community education platform that maps the geographic migration of people out of Africa with representation on the global reach of, of the African diaspora. And though Wallace is unable to join us, I wanna share a little bit about her practice as well. She's a multidisciplinary artist and researcher whose work documents the experience and poetics of the urban landscape through oral history, history and ethnographic film performance and artist walking practices. So Jessica, Kyra, Kyra, and Shari, the floor is yours. Amazing, thank you so much for that introduction. All right, so if we could get our slides up, please. Thank you. All right, so my name is Kyra Asabe Bonsu. And my name is Jessica Cortez. I am wearing a black t-shirt with flamingo beaded earrings, uh, sitting in front of a white background. And oh. I would also like to uh, name Wallace Johnson as well as one of our group members. He's not here today. I forgot to describe myself, sorry. I am wearing a white tank top. I have long black braids and I am a black woman. Hi, I'm Shari Jones. I uh, am wearing a gray t-shirt. I have some background noise because my daughter is very present as you will see throughout our presentation it has been throughout this whole practice. Um, and I'm actually sitting in front of a painting that she made of the Encanto family, which was a hit earlier uh, in the year. <laughs> Um, I think we're ready for the next slide. All right, so I will be giving you all an overview of our activation. Um, our activation, Sidewalk Dreams, as you can see, this was our flyer that CFL of the LP team so beautifully designed for us. Um, our activation was really a dream altar that we wanted to create and invite community members of bed -Stuy to dream with us and to um, create a space for radical imagining of, um, of the future. Um, Wallace was the one who came to us with this idea when we were brainstorming of a dream altar. And we all fell in love with that idea because altars are um, a vital part in so many different cultures. And personally for me, it has been part of my practice um, as a Chicana woman for Dia de los Muertos. Um, so I love the idea of creating a communal altar for folks to write down their dreams and to um, share them with each other. So that was a little bit about our, um, our actual activation. And to enhance that, we created, we wanted people to write poems um, to express their dreams. So we created dream cards for people to respond to. Um, 
these prompts um, were developed together and I'll read them out loud to you, but I'd also like to invite you all to respond to a prompt that calls to you. Um, and you can do that in the chat right now. So some of our prompts were um, inspired by bed artists. As you can see, our first one that we came up with was It Was All a Dream by Biggie. Um, and since we were um, originally gonna do our activation in May, we wanted to honor Biggie's legacy and his birthday. And that was one of our prompts that we had as a bed artist. Another one was I've Been Dreaming of a Place, Stephanie Mills, who's also a bed artist. And um, We Are Our Ancestors' Wildest Dreams is another quote that I love and I first heard from um, a visual artist from New Orleans, Brandon Mike Odoms, who I love his work as well. And so these um, prompts were made available at our activation for community members to respond to and write their dreams. And then they added those on the altar. In addition to the dream cards, we also had tissue paper flowers where we invited community members to join us in making tissue paper flowers as well to add to our altar in addition to the uh, dream cards. And we can go to the next slide. And this is an image of our dream altar. We were so blessed to be able to use Lasagna Cruz's We The News um, new stand. And we adorned it with blue fabric because um, we were inspired by Langston Hughes's, po Langston Hughes's poem um, that talks about bringing dreams and wrapping it in a blue cloud cloth. So that was the inspiration behind that. Um, so I'm going to pass it off to my group mate, Kyra. Hi. All right. So for our project, it was really important that we were able to engage as well as to inspire the bedside community and beyond. So we came to the name Sidewalk Dreams after first coming with the name Dream Altar Celebrate Community because we really wanted to create a space that was both engaging visually, inviting with colors, materials, and also like flexible materials, uh, activities, pardon me. Go to the next slide. So in the beginning, we had a lot of ideas. <laughs> um, we were brainstorming for a while and we did know that we, you know, we wanted something that was meditative, um, that was relaxing, but was also a place where people could, um, you know, feel that comfortable. Um, and so after our call with Ebony, we were able to shorten it down to an altar um, where the community could write their dreams. And so we, these carefully crafted prompts were created and, um, we realized also prior to meeting with Ebony that we had the we had a lot of like in connections, right? So we all are coming from different backgrounds. We all love a collage of voices and representing them. And we also wanted to create something that's joyful and celebratory. So collective dreaming was really, really important. So in this slide, uh, we really wanted to initially engage with business owners, but then we thought, Okay, it could be business owners, or we could also just engage with the community as a whole. And so uh, we had to be very bold on our activation. We made sure to, um, and particularly Sherry and I, we were like going out, talking to people, bikers, our first photo, um, as well as family. Um, and our very first person who came up, who told us actually who like helped us use the Polaroid, which I'll get to later, um, um, which is a very important part of our project. But basically um, we knew that we wanted as many people to come up so we were, you know, outgoing as well as making sure that the space was inviting. Next slide. So we knew that making tissue paper flowers could be, uh, you know, people are coming in different levels. So we wanted to make sure that we were there to support them. So, but also make sure that there were like different options. So we had some flowers that were already pre-made, whereas others, as you can see here, we were helping to show um, community members how to create them, which is a really fun activity. Next slide. It was also very, very helpful to have LP members um, who like helped us like kind of like prototype our prompts. So uh, we kind of started thinking of all these different you know, poems and thoughts that we wanted people to respond to and realize that, you know, the simpler, the better. So uh, 
as Jessica said, we we chose prompts that were relatable, but also that we ourselves could uh, respond to. And we also had really great helper, Sana, who is Shari's daughter, who really helped us get our altar together, as you can see in the photo on the right. Next slide. So uh, also very really important to note, we had cards in English and Spanish, um, more for inclusivity. But again, coming back to the Polaroid, uh, so our process was we would either go out and we would engage with people um, or they'd stop by because our altar was pretty eye catching. Um, then we would invite them to either do tissue paper flowers or as well as to um, or as well as to write the prompt. Uh, then once they write, write the, the poem, write a prompt in the poem <laughs> or write to the poem, pardon me. Then we take a picture with a Polaroid and uh, that Polaroid was something they could take home with themselves um, as kind of like a memento. And then they would put the actual card on the um, altar for all the world to see. Next slide. And so this is just more of us, just our more community members engaging with the with the dream cards and what that felt like. And it was a really good day because there was some activities, lots of activities going on. So that was really fun. And now I'm going to pass it on to Shari. Thank you. So can we get the slides please? Thank you. And so Jess, I'm going to actually speak to takeaways, challenges, and lingering questions that we had. Um, some general event planning takeaways that we had was monitoring the weather and holiday overlap. So our initial uh, exhibit was planned for Mother's Day weekend. Um, which we you know discussed in terms of traffic and how that may impact things and then it was also forecasted to rain and so we did um reschedule our event and so that was just some general event planning uh, takeaways and i would say the main takeaway that we had as my group members um spoke to was community building and so our exhibit really out allowed for um community building in a number of ways. The first being, as you can see here with this slide, is that we were part of a larger community event. So when we rescheduled, we actually rescheduled to an event that was taking place um, at Restoration, which is not too far from the storefront. And so that allowed for um, more engagement because of the increased traffic but then it also added to the energy of the day which you can see with performances there were entertainers walking around there was meditation um and different folks uh there as a part of a larger event so that was one of the main takeaways for community building next slide thank you was intergenerational connections and you see an example here with kyra um and one of the participants that we had next slide please and then you see another example here with sana who is my daughter assisting another young participant that we had and also Jessica with an older participant that we had again speaking to that intergenerational community building. Um, next slide please. The other thing that we had for or main takeaway that we had around community building was leaving our project open ended. So we had the altar and part of um, having an unfinished product was that folks would be able to add to the exhibit. Um, and you can see some examples here, we participate uh, adding to the tissue paper flowers. Um, next slide, please. And then these are some of the examples of the poems that folks provided or prompts that folks provided um, at the altar. These are also some of the Polaroids that were left over that we were able to have with Project Sustainability um, in a photo book of poems um, and the photos that were left over. And so, yes, next slide, please. Is that the last slide? Okay, yeah, I was gonna stand. And this is another example of the inclusivity that Cairo was speaking to. Um, 
in terms of the language here's a last snapshot of us uh i did have my apron on so i borrowed it rightfully so because she was very much part um of our activation and then this is an example i believe of the altar like right before we broke it down and brought it back to the storefront um and so yeah those were our main takeaways was really community building and those different aspects that allowed us to do that some challenges that we discussed during our debriefing was um maybe having more audience share outs of actual verbal share outs and so because there was the stage with the rescheduled event there was opportunity for them to share out um and then I guess lingering questions, our last point was um, just audience experience. We wish there was some formal survey that we had to see how folks felt about sharing their dreams, but we did debrief some of the anecdotes that we had, as Kyra mentioned, around the Polaroid. That was very nostalgic for a lot of folks. So even just getting assistance from audience members, that was really um, nice. And then also Jessica had some share outs about folks that she was engaging with um that really spoke firmly and positively towards the um activity and event next slide please thank you um so to close it out we just want to say that we are extremely grateful to the laundromat project for their uh, continued support through this process um you know the workshops were invaluable they were amazing and we learned a lot for me personally um, I was really grateful that the laundromat project had such um, research made available to us that they've already done in the community of bed with their deep listening project that has been ongoing and they made that available to us with a deck where we were able to look at the laundromat projects history in bed and then also learn more about um, the history of bed they had all that research already for us to go so that when we embed in the community and have our activation, we were fully prepared for that. Yeah, and I second that. I really appreciated the not only the resources, but as well as the artist RXs and all the workshops. I felt it was a great launching point for us to really understand more of the program and more about our creative practice and what we're looking for. And I'll just stir that um, in terms of time and I want to be mindful, but the whole experience was, you know, mind blowing and we had some time to debrief. Um, and as my oven is going off, I feel like it's almost a serendipitous reminder that um, we should move on. So thank you. Yes, the whole experience was greatly appreciated. Well, thank you so much for that presentation and for offering those prompts to the audience. I've seen a couple of your responses and I hope you can continue to contribute. Um, it really seems like you're centering this, um, the, uh, the question of dreaming as sort of a critical action. And I was curious if you could talk a little bit about how you see that embodied experience as, as sort of vital or relevant to community um, empowerment, the act of dreaming. I can start. Um, I think the act of dreaming provides a uh, hope. It provides an opportunity for those to um, build towards something or to uh, facilitate a world in which they currently don't have. It's been a rough couple of years for all of us. Um, and for many of us, it's been like that for our entire lives. So it's really important that you have the opportunity to um, believe that there is more um, and also that you believe that your community can grow and that you can be a part of it as it grows um, for the better. So I think that's a very crucial thing. And that was something that we thought about a lot with this, um, with our presentation, restorative, 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 restorative action. Enjoy. Absolutely. Do we have time to read out one of the uh, responses from the yeah. audience? Sure. Absolutely. Fantastic. Jessica, I'll, I'll let you lead the way. Okay. Um, yes. I also want to just um, highlight one of the poems from the action that we did before I rerun from the chat that um, really just, I think, encapsulated this act of dreaming and why it's so critical. Um, it's, it reads, I dream that my community come together and heal after the COVID-19 pandemic, that we look out for one another and learn from our experience. 
I dream that my city has more public transportation, community gardens, excellent public school system, affordable public health care system. So just those concrete like asks and those concrete of, of writing it down on paper and putting it up for people to see, it's just that step towards manifesting that reality. Um, and that's so valuable. And I will read one from the chat. Um, let's see. I've been dreaming of a place where we disrupt capitalism through the embodiment of rest and resting in public space. Ooh, wow. <laughs> that's, that's incredible. Powerful. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all again for sharing this reflection and for these prompts. I'm sure we'll um, be holding on to that kind of power of imagination as we continue our respective works. I wanna move on to our second presentation of the evening. Um, that one is by the artists Jing Dong and Natalia Guzman Solano. Their collaborative project shares some connective tissue with the previous work we just talked about. The project is called Spread Out and the public interventions took place in a playground with a focus on generating rest and neighborly connections. So just a little bit about the artist. Jing is a theater maker focusing on creating research-based and community-based interdisciplinary performances. She believes that theater is a space for people to gather, share, and imagine a collective future. Natalia is a Latinx feminist agent of change and solidarity work. An activist, scholar, and ethnographer by training, she is interested in co-creating community-led, emergent, and transformative visions that deepen our collective understanding of the ways that the justice system intersects with inter environmental issues. So I'm looking forward to learning more about your work together. And audience members, just a reminder to please continue to share your comments and reflections in the chat so we can engage with these and the artists later. Jing and Natalia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Natasha. Hi, everyone. My name is Jing. I'm an Asian woman wearing a white shirt, and my background is green and white walls. Hi, everyone. I'm wearing a navy uh, kind of polka dotted button down shirt. I have eyeglasses and very short cropped hair. Um, please show the first slide. Okay, so Natalia and I are a two person group. Our activation project is called Spread Out. It is an invitation to relaxation, rest, expansion, and connection. Next slide. In our project, we devised the multiple ways to do this. Next slide. When we did our research on the neighborhood, we learned about its demographics, uh, history, culture, local businesses, arts, and activism. And walking on the streets also gave us a lot of information and inspirations. We know it's a very lively neighborhood, and Fulton Street is often very busy. People walk by really fast. Sometimes it can feel overwhelming. We know that this area is among the most gentrified areas in the city. And also from listening to oral history recordings of local residents, we learned that it used to be a place where everyone knows everyone and the people watched out for each other. This sense of a community and home is what we hope to pay tribute to in our project. Um, can we go back to last slide? Yeah. So one day I was imagining what if people don't just pass by the street, what if we can slow down and rest right on the street of our neighborhood and make it our home. So Natalia and I are both very interested in exploring how to cultivate spaces of joy and relaxation in urban life. Next slide. We wanted to create a station, a change of pace, a new perspective of the neighborhood and create an encounter with people, place and self. We wanted to reimagine spaces of rest. Next slide, please. While we were developing our plan, we got an invitation to join the community event on St. Andrew's Playground. It was an amazing opportunity for us to work with friends of St. Andrew's Playground and to address a real issue. They have been advocating for renovations for the playground. If you have been there, you probably know a large area of the playground is empty concrete field, and they want to turn it into a space friendly to all kinds of activities for neighbors. 
it was so lovely that we as artists could help reimagine the future of the playground and creating a space for rest is the possibility we proposed for the playground's future. Next slide, please. And these are ways in which we wanted our project to achieve its goals. Rest, both body and mind, combine low focus and high focus activities, connect archive to everyday context, make space and create connections. Next slide. So I worked on two low focus activities. On our community day, when people entered the playground, um, the sign on the ground led them to a variety of iced tea I prepared so they can grab a bottle and continue with their day. But they were also invited to hang out with us. There are stickers on the tea bottles with prompts they're invited to follow. Next slide. These are several examples of um, stickers on bottles. Lie on a hammock and take a nap. We did have two hammocks prepared for people. Next slide. And this one is a breathing activity that helps you relax. Next slide. Ask someone what they like about a playground, dreaming together. And next slide. And this is an opportunity to connect with other people. And there are more of them. It's a game with low stakes. Next slide. And I also prepared this resting area where people can sit down, lie down on hammocks, or spread out on the picnic mat. And over to you, Natalia. Thank you, Jing. Um, and I also want to say that definitely uh, in response to one of the, the um, chat the, the chat um, drop-ins from um, our viewers, I think this our activation was also trying to really harness this idea of making rest available in public spaces. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, I'll begin talking about the high focus activities we had in our activation. So our high focus activities involved reflection on placemaking and placekeeping through spatial visualizations. Here in the images, um, we're showing the maps that um, we used. So on the one hand, we were inviting participants to interact with three historical maps of New York City with an emphasis on Brooklyn. The maps were layered to emphasize the changing and constructed nature of spatial boundaries and placemaking. We ask community members, what is a place of rest for you in your neighborhood? Where do you go to relax? Once participants wrote down their responses on a post-it, they placed them at the site of this location on the map. Next slide, please. On the other hand, we also provided a whiteboard geared at engaging with our younger participants. And there was a prompt asking them to imagine relaxation in relation to green spaces. For this part of the activity, we wanted to encourage visions that drew on what could be imagined for green spaces. And this was really important to us given the efforts to reimagine and uplift St. Andrew's Playground. Next slide, please. So our strategies for implementing our activation, our project, including being mindful of the temporality and ephemeral quality of interacting with passerbys. So we sought to design low impact activities. Next slide, please. These are two examples of the whiteboard activity and they really show how various imaginings are able to exist side by side, to overlap or to be renewed by each new visualization. Ultimately, this process of visualizing becomes an important step in enacting and cultivating reflection. Next slide, please. We also offer different forms of nourishment, so not only to the body, but to the mind without any obligation. Next slide, please. 
Finally, we envisioned our project design as a subtle invitation for people to share knowledge and to connect. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, we learned that for an outdoor activity, the weather plays a big role. Uh, could you show the slide, please? Thank you. Um, the type of tea um, is important. Back in spring, when it was still cold, I was imagining like a hot Kung Fu tea I can make for people. But the lovely people from the LP suggested iced tea because it would happen in May. And actually, um, our participants really loved the iced tea. And also shade is very important in hot days. <laughs> Natalia? Yeah, um, right. And in thinking about how to reach the community, um, we can go back to the, the slide, thank you. Um, our process hinged on the importance of learning about bed and getting to know our audience. So for our project, that meant also being attentive to the sensitivities of bed communities. Upon finalizing our project, we also reflected upon and have been reflecting upon the possibilities for scaling and reproducing this activation. So much like our, our fellows with Sidewalk Dreams, um, this is an important part of considering the afterlife of our, our activation. The activities we designed are flexibly imagined to provide room for adapting to different contexts with similar goals in mind. Next slide. And we really appreciate the workshops, events, research materials, office hour meetings, and producing support the Laundromat project team provided to us. And, and I also just want to express my love for the fellowship design guide. It's a great framework. And we as artists and fellows come from different backgrounds. So figuring out what our group values are helped us establish a good foundation for our collaboration and to contemplate our relationship with the community we work in. And SM mapping was also really helpful. It guided us to think through what we were capable of doing with the time and resource available and how to find resonance and unity in our project design. And just to close that out, as someone with a background in ethnography and cultural anthropology, I really benefited from learning about how ethical accountability takes place through cultural organizing that was super valuable to me, and also by attending to the different stages of collaboration. Next, next slide, please. So our project wouldn't have been possible without the material, intellectual, and emotional support from the Laundromat Project, our Create Change Fellows, and all of our friends and family. To those of you who are also supporters of the LP or in one way or another are supporting the arts, thank you. We're immensely grateful to the bed neighbors who are welcoming and opening to our presence in the neighborhood May we build together change to last. Thank you. Well, thank you both Natalia and Jing. Um, very moving. <laughs> um, I y'all, this is it's it's I feel very lucky to be in the room with y'all. This is really such powerful work. And I really love the way both your project and Sidewalk Dreams sort of prioritize prioritize this idea of um collective future building there's this manifestation and vis visualization these techniques that are really proven to facilitate change um and the way you prioritize sl slowness which is so often taken for granted in public space so i was just wondering if you could share a little bit more about um you know much of what you created really transported people into you know a sense of ease um, and enjoyment and i was wondering if you could share a little bit more about how that connects with your individual practices before we move on Um, I can start. So I think I'm a theater maker. So theater is really about creating a space where people can have discussions about what the community's needs are and what the future uh, we want to create together. So I was inspired by other theater artists' works and also by theater games. 
to create the, the prompts for um, participants to to follow. But it's also very similar to in the theater and people as audience or participants, they are able, it's important that they are able to choose whether they want to fully participate or they want to observe or they want just want to process the, the prompts in their mind. And I think all those different options, um, what, whichever they choose to participate, we are really um, grateful for, for everyone's participation and think it will manifest like in a really subtle way in their daily daily lives. Yeah. Thanks, Jing. I would say that um, probably my process and development um, and my own reflections on rest come out of my longer um, training in the academy and how I always felt unsatisfied by the the rhythm and the push that's very much still within a like heteropatriarchal capitalist system, right? As much as it is about providing education and schooling, it still works within a framework that sort of teaches and um, reproduces these myths about um, having to work all the time and that we really don't have time to even take care of our bodies. So for me, it's been a long process, like years of unlearning um, these, these myths, right? And so for me, it's essential in, in any kind of work that I do, um, I mean, starting from, from when I was um, still in, the, in, in grad school in the academy, um, to really focus on how to bring ease and mindfulness, right? Like to be more present and um, to really, I think that is where we find the abundance um, out of there stems like an abundance in for our lives. Um, so it's really essential for me. Thank you so much for answering these and for your thoughtful presentation. Really appreciate Thank the responses. Um, we're going to move on to our final presentation for the night, and that presentation is around a project titled Flags of bed -Stuy. So the work explores the flag as a cultural device that speaks to community diversity and representation. The artists who designed this activation are Mon M. Majin Isaac and Brianna Harlan. Mon is an Indian abolitionist propagandist, writer, and artist whose work focuses on national and local jail moratoriums anti-surveillance obfuscation practices, not a word I say out loud every single day, and building organizing capacity for abolitionist collaboration in the US and beyond. Majin is a painter whose practice is rooted in her Haitian American identity, upbringing and Afro-diasporic stories. She explores themes of nostalgia and familiarity by reconstructing and assembling melanges of urban and tropical environments to create utopias and realms of her imagination. And Brianna is a multi-form artist and organizer. She works in community intervention and recontextualize objects to innovate on how social, political identi identity affects health, selfhood, and community. And the floor is y'all's, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Hello, everyone. We are so happy to have the chance to talk about our work with you, so thank you for coming. My name is Brianna Harlan. My pronouns are she or they. I'm an African-American woman with my hair in twists. I'm wearing a yellow button-down shirt and I have a striped blanket thing behind me. Hi everyone, um, my name is Mon. I'm so excited to be talking with all of you today and to be talking about our project. I'm wearing a light blue dress, which has a collar at the top with a black vest on top and I have a blurred brown background in my house. I'm wearing orange glasses and I'm South Asian. Um, yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Imagine and I'm an African-American woman, pronouns are she, hers. And I am wearing a light blue tank top. I'm wearing an Afro and I'm against a white background. Okay, we'll have our slides down please. So as it was said, we created Flags of bed as a collective activity to speak to the incredible diversity of bed -Stuy. 
Blacks hold a complicated place in culture. Sometimes they used to propagate nationalism and hatred. Other times they symbolize community resilience and resistance to assimilation. So we thought of flags like David Hammond's African-American flag, the Pan-African flag, the flag of Puerto Rican independence and the flags um, of places like Palestine. We also considered flags that weren't necessarily flags in the traditional sense, but more of what they meant to people our community. And this includes quilts, banners, posters, prayer flags, and more. And we hope that flags of bed inspired people to express neighborhood and community pride, which we think of as, as important as national or institutional pride. So the idea came to us because we wanted an activity that anyone could do that supported them and made space for them to reflect and express on their feelings and ideas for bed -Stuy. Next slide, please. These are some examples of flags we looked at for inspiration, the abolitionist flag, black American flag, Palestinian flag, and the Romare Bearden flag. Next slide, please. We asked, what would a flag that represents your neighborhood look like? What would the flag of bed look like? Describe bed in a few words. If you could introduce or transform something about bed what would it be? And our ideal audience was longstanding bed residents, bed parents, kids, and Black bed residents. Next slide, please. So why are they doing what they're doing? To self-identify and claim agency within a larger ge geographical context and to express the identity of their neighborhood during a time of change and shifting ideals. Because as we know, that side is being heavily gentrified. Next slide, please. As um, our co-fellows kind of talked about, we thought a lot about the Fulton, you know, Fulton Street itself, the laundromat project, um, street front, the window, how we could make the best use of the space, and what the people, uh, you know, who was going to be walking by, whether they were going to have time, whether they were going to be in a rush, whether we were trying to get the attention of families and kids. We saw our project as being really family friendly and kid friendly because it was so tactile and so joyful. So we were really trying to engage people with kids and letting them know that we would be there for people who wanted to return. Um, anytime someone stopped by, you know, one of us would be yelling, do you want to make a flag? Um, and we scaled down the activation actually by doing just one table and having people gather and converse around it. I think our goal was to have something where people were also talking about bed and talking about where they were from and their neighbors while building these flags and actually influencing each other's projects. Next slide. We, on the day of, we actually designed a, a blue flag ourselves to hold in the background. And then Madge and Brianna and I also made flags to show people how they could do their own flags and to model what a flag could look like. We didn't have any clear definitions. We wanted people to be really creative and open in their idea of what a flag could be. And then we asked people to pose for Polaroids as kind of a memento, something for us to keep and something for them to look at. We also took extra photos for people who are really excited about their flags because we wanted to keep them. We displayed the flags on a clothesline behind the activation so that passersby would be interested in sitting down. I think it was a very directly engaged activation where we were able to have conversations with people who stopped by and a lot of the people who kind of stopped by to build flags actually ended up staying for longer or just having conversations or making more or just adding more and more to their flags. And so that was also an interesting thing about the activation was that you could take as little time as you wanted or as much time as you wanted. And I think we had really thought about that in designing the project as well, that if people are in a rush or if people wanna stay, how can we design it so that it works with a lot of different kinds of time. Next slide. Having a wide variety of materials, including street sign stickers that we made, artificial flowers, shapes, felt, kente fabric, vinyl paper, meant that there was a lot of visual diversity. And 
actually the idea for the street sign stickers we came up with like three days before the actual activation and i think it was one of the coolest ideas that we integrated into the activation of project and i think something i would love to even see us going further with but almost everybody's flag ended up using some of these little symbols so it was cool to see how people whether or not they lived in bed integrated these stickers from bed into their flags and really located it in the neighborhood. And it also increased people's familiarity with the kind of iconic streets of bed -Stuy. We decided on the materials by thinking about what would be easiest to work with, what would be most accessible, what would be easiest to cut, and what would be familiar to the people who are going to be working on these flags. Um, and we also thought a lot about what would resonate with the community the most while generating the kinds of thoughts we wanted. Next slide. Thanks, Simon and Brianna. I'll be chatting more about some of the takeaways and our lingering thoughts and comments. Um, some of our takeaways include we were able to meet bed folks where they were. Um, we held space for them to reimagine, share, play, intergenerational connection, agency, pride, and collaboration. The prompts really made folks think about their positionality and vets die, and children were really able to engage because of the tactile nature of the activity. And others just simply wanted to engage in the joyful aspect of the activity, especially just spending you know, a couple of minutes on a Saturday, um, just engaging in really colorful and bright uh, materials. And so together, folks were able to make a meaningful um, experience and redefine the functionality of a flag. Um, yeah, it was really a really fun uh, activity. So some of our successes, I, well, I feel like our successes actually outweigh some of our challenges. Um, we had very few challenges, which included scaling down the project. We had very grand, um, ideas to have uh, a huge installation and have uh, someone, you know, sew everything together and eventually have this live in a space. But I think that, you know, for the nature of the project, for having it for a couple of like hours, it just made sense to have um, clothing line and to put the, the flags on uh, attached to pins. And uh, I think that folks are able to really stop and engage and really adore the flags as they were. And um, we did have a small table too. I think that we did generate a lot of buzz, but it also made the experience very intimate and fun. And I think that we also did a really great job with thinking on our feet about the materials that were very um, meaningful to bed -Stuy. So visual markers such as stickers of bed -Stuy street names and train stations um, were really important to have for folks to connect to uh, their flags. And some of the lingering questions, if we were to do this again, and possibilities for the future, uh, we imagined uh, what it would look like to facilitate a longer activation uh, within different locations of bed -Stuy. This activity can also exist in many forms and lengths, such as an icebreaker or a more generative um, month-long activation. We also imagined how cool it would be to have um, folks bring in their own materials, such as the fabrics, meaningful and sentimental objects and photos that would highlight their memories, upbringing, families, experiences with the neighborhood. And we also, again, wanted to have a larger installation, but I know that that's, you know, we can definitely get to that in the future and uh, have this, have, have the flag live in a very, uh, you know, public space where folks can also come by and always see their their works. And I think that that would be like a really rewarding and empowering um, thing where folks can have accessibility to their works. Um, the installation can also be a form of preserving the neighborhood and what it means for current residents. And I think about what future generations can learn from the community rhythm from these flags, if you know, this were to live in an actual space. And I mean, like rhythms such as like the values and priorities and even concerns of the community. Thank you. I want to make sure I didn't cut you off. Is there any any wrap up before I move on? I was muted. Yes. Okay, go for it. 
Um, the entering, building, and exiting communities workshop was a key takeaway that I had for our project. It really inspired us to create an activation that allowed us to build relationships throughout the um, day and throughout each person's session and tailor it specifically to them. Um, we entered softly and were able to offer a session that folks were able to feel complete in. So it didn't require a lot of follow up or wrapping up or a feeling of lingering, maybe that we should have stayed longer or that we didn't stay long enough. But it's also can be replicated so we can come back as many times as the interest as the community is interested in. Yeah, and this quality of replication, I think, is one of the most standout uh, qualities of this activation. It's cool that it can be done in so many different ways and be utilized in so many different communities. I definitely can see, for example, being used as part of a public housing project where people in part of a public housing community uh, create flags together to like ground themselves in their own location. It's a really um, place-based activation that I think benefits from learning from the communities and the geography and the story of the people around it. I also think even, and Madrin mentioned this, some of the limitations were creatively generative and pushed us to speak specifically to our audience since they were almost not like limitations. They were just kind of helping us design the project. And of course, we're incredibly grateful for the um, economic and material and emotional support that the laundromat project provided us um, for the larger laundromat project community and bed residents who stopped by, and especially for TR's immense support for our requests and last minute needs uh, up until the day of the activation. And of course, for my co-fellows, it really felt like these were, this was our shared brainchild and something we just really enjoyed doing together. Yeah, we'd like to thank the LP for helping us the past couple of months and providing us with resources and workshops uh, entering building, exiting community, wow. centering POC power and privileges. Uh, the scavenger hunt, which also encouraged us to spend time within a neighborhood and learn more about the cultural landscape. And I'm really looking forward to utilizing what we've learned for future and personal projects. Thank you. Oh, that was awesome. I love thinking about these tools, flags, these tools for, you know, both uh, propaganda and pride and really a reclamation of it. And you're reminding me of my own struggles as a parent of a pre-K pre person who was like responsible for making the flag project and how I wish I'd had this workshop. And so I definitely can see so many opportunities for replication and kind of picking up where 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 you left off with the, with the intervention. Um, before we wrap, um, I just was thinking it'd be nice if you could share um, did you consider, I mean, flags are really interesting because they, you're really positioning them as this tool for, you know, both resistance and liberation um, um, and really kind of centering on how they can make meaning or represent meaning for so many people. Did you consider any other cultural devices or objects throughout your process or was it always the flags or why? We actually did consider um, love notes. Uh, and actually, at Brown, I'll let you speak to that. But in addition to love notes, we can and just notes, like kind of notes and bouquets and that kind of thing. We also thought about gardens mm -hmm. and essentially um, things that, because because so much of our project was focused on joy, I think we were thinking about ways that certain mechanisms could be utilized for joy. So even love notes as like something um, to distribute amongst people. That's cool. Yeah, and the significance of the love notes also were that people could come and not even do the project necessarily. So it was a labor free offering to the community and to tailor them specifically to Bedside. But instead of giving love notes, we ended up giving a lot of people a copy of their Polaroid. So we took two Polaroids. And so they were able to have that instead. And a lot of people were really excited about that being able to um, have like a memento. And Polaroids are kind of expensive now. So a lot of people were really excited. Um, and then we also thought about quilts as well as a way of storytelling. So we thought about taking our flags and making them into a giant quilt so that instead of having each person's singular story on a flag, you would see the neighborhood story um, on a quilt. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I could totally imagine that. And I love your point, Majin, about how the, it you know, kind of, it's almost like an archive of the moment. Um, and so even if, 
you didn't inter, you know, create that part, portion now, you could always pick it up. That's a really interesting idea. Um, well, I will not talk forever. I know we have to wrap up. So I wanna say thank you again to Mon, Majin and Brianna. Um, this project's really bright and commemorative offering for your neighborhood, for the neighborhood. Um, I think that brings us to the end of our time together. So I wanna say thanks again. Um, it's really, like I said, I feel privileged to be in this space with you all and for the artists here today sharing such thoughtful and dynamic um, projects and ideas and offerings. Um, so thank you for sharing so openly with us with these strategies and I will turn it back over to Catherine, the Director of Programs at LP and thank you and good night. Thank you all so much. This was a beautiful, beautiful program. And again, we want to thank you. Um, we want to thank all of our wonderful Create Change fellows for these dynamic presentations. Um, and as I was listening to all of the presentations, there were a few words. Um, I always use the number three uh, to hold with me. And so three words from each of the projects that, that came up. Uh, for Sidewalk Dreams, Jessica, Kyra, Shari, and Wallace, um, the words that came into my, my spirit were flexibility and intergenerational processes, uh, restorative action, and dreams of healing. For the flags of that sky, Mon, Brianna, and Majin, the words that came to my spirit as you spoke were community pride, modeling creativity, amplifying joy. And for spread out, Jane and Natalia, the words that came to my spirit in your presentation were reimagining places of rest, advocacy, relaxation, and ethical accountability. We can all reflect on those words, those statements, and allow them to resonate with you all as we leave today, tonight, um, to help us guide us on, along our journeys as well. And so we hope that you all got a chance to learn about the work, um, about the amazing work of uh, this season and have grabbed all of the artists' website links and social media handles to connect with them further. Um, I want to also thank our LP team who worked so hard behind the scenes to make tonight possible. Uh, our program team, Lady Sasha, Tiara, Tiavel, Andrea, and Brittany. And of course, like Kimmy said earlier in the presentation, it takes a village. So we also want to thank and um, amplify the work of our development, operations, and communications team at the LP. We want to also thank our board, our funders, and supporters as well. And again, thank you all so much for taking the time to be with us tonight. If you have not done so yet, please follow us on social media, subscribe to our email list, and join us the next time. Um, and stay tuned for our upcoming programs and opportunities. And before I close out, I'd like to take a moment uh, for all of you, anyone has a glass or anything, water, whatever beverage that you would like to toast to, but I would like to toast to uh, Lady Sasha. Lady Sasha is uh, an incredible, our incredible program, I'm sorry, it's arts, artist development manager on our program team. And she is transitioning her role next week. And so we want to take a moment, Lady Sasha, to celebrate you, to toast you for your hard work at the LP for all of these years along this journey and building this, these programs into what they are today helping so many artists um, in New York City and beyond grow to where they are. Um, it is not unnoticed. It is not an acknowledged. We appreciate you. We wish you well on your journey. Thank you so much for your hard work. And I'll pass it to Kemi. I believe Kemi wants to say a few words as well in toast. And if not, then we can move on or maybe not. All right. Well, with no, that. no, sorry, oh, you know, technical difficulties, <laughs> and we're not on the script. So sorry, Albert. Um, but yes, just wanted to follow up. Those are beautiful. Uh, it was a beautiful program, as it always is. So thank you to all the artists. Thank you, uh, Catherine, for those summations. But yes, I wanted to take just a moment to recognize and thank um, Lady, uh, Lady Sasha. Um, the daughter of Gorgeous Jones and others. Uh, <laughs> that's real, y'all. Yeah. Um, and you, um, I remember you were actually in my very first uh, full uh, 
class of Create Changers way back in 2013. Um, so Lady is an alum. Uh, then, you know, in 2018 came on uh, the team as a team member, uh, our artist engagement manager and has led that work uh, for the last uh, four years, just shy of four years, really deepened the work, um, asked challenging questions, incredible commitment to the artist, which I think you even heard folks saying uh, today. And she's off uh, to Princeton uh, to become Dr. Lady Sasha Jones. Um, and to further architectural history and our understanding of play and our understanding of blackness and creativity and joy and all of those beautiful things. And it's been developing that work for a while. Um, there was a bidding war over her, y'all. This was not, this was not, this is not regular. And <laughs> she um, has only just begun. Uh, she's already done so many beautiful things uh, before at Schomburg and and other places and in the world. Um, but we are so proud, so excited, and can't wait for what's next. So just here's a toast to possibilities. <laughs> oh, wonderful. I just. No, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to our community of artists. Thank you, Kimmy and Catherine, for that wonderful send off. Uh, it's, it's a surprise, y'all. So I, I'm, I'm full of gratitude and very moved. Um, but yeah, this is this is an evening really to celebrate all the wonderful creativity and cultural production and ideas and um, incredible cultural organizing. I mean, all the all the wonderful effort that you you heard uh, from this group of artists. It's been my honor and joy to do this work and to support you all. Um, and I'm just, I don't know, I'm very, very, very happy, very happy to celebrate and share this night with you all. Thank you. Thank you to the artists. Thank you, Natasha. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm.